Okay, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Um, we're going to talk about questions about PRP therapy. Um, I do ask that at the end, if you have any questions, um, we would prefer for you to use the Q&A tab um, to ask your questions. It's easier for us to kind of follow and answer those questions in the order that they come in. So again, welcome. Um, I'm going to be here kind of every Wednesday throughout the month of February. I think this is the third webinar uh, in a row that I've done um, around lunchtime. We'll discuss different topics um, kind of over the next few weeks. This is our agenda for today. Um, we'll talk about a little bit of a background on female hair loss, the history of PRP therapy, um, kind of the newest our newer method in treating hair loss, um, new in the last five years, and how and why PRP protocols differ. We'll talk about OPC, which is optimal platelet concentra concentration therapy, and then treatment result expectations. We'll save time for the end. Um, again, for questions, we do ask that you use the Q&A uh, tab in the end. And if there's for some reason um, we run out of time, um, or I'm unsure exactly on how to answer your question, we will uh, reach you via email and get that answer for you. Um, so PRP has really become one of the most popular treatments for female hair loss. Um, clinical studies have proven how effective it can be. However, the biggest concern with PRP is currently that there's no standard protocol, which means it's performed kind of variably uh, from one practice to another. So during this webinar, um, we're gonna review why protocols differ, how we choose our treatment protocols, and then go over any questions um, before starting treatment. So uh, this could be a little bit repetitive for those of you who have been tuning in every week, but um, I am Sarah, I'm one of the nurse practitioners here. I've been a nurse for about 10 years. I've been an NP for about five. Um, I've spent the last five years doing a lot of aesthetics and PRP hair restoration, um, and I'm new to the practice as of this fall. So a few updates, um, our offices are opened. We do have enhanced safety protocols in place. We're kind of going above and beyond to keep our patients and our staff safe. Um, we're doing temperature screening, masks are required at all times. Um, we're sanitizing between each rooms. We have a limited number of appointments each day. So we're limiting kind of foot traffic. We have air purifiers in each room. Um, we are still available by phone and video appointment if for some reason you're unavailable to come in or still not comfortable coming in in person. And we do recommend that you take advantage of the video appointments. Um, they're super helpful just to kind of get started and make any little recommendations or tweaks that we can before coming into the office to see you. Um, and we are shipping products. Uh, we do it all the time to just make sure that you continue to get your treatment. Um, we also have on our website, the online store that's available. Um, so you can order your products through that as well. So we'll talk quickly about female hair loss. Um, if you've been to the last few webinars, again, this will seem a bit repetitive, but for our new people listening, I will review this pretty quickly. Um, so about female hair loss, there's uh, different life cycles and then types of hair loss. And we'll talk about how to treat. So hair life cycle and types, um, there's three phases of the normal hair life cycle. So the antigen phase is known as the growth phase. This can last anywhere from two to six years. In this phase, the hair is receiving all the nutrients that it needs. Um, the hair is actively growing. And one of our treatment goals is to prolong this phase. The next is the catagen phase. This is also known as the transition phase. This can last anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, there's no further growth happening here. And then in the telogen phase, this is also known as the resting phase, um, can last anywhere from three to four months. Um, you know, it's the actual shedding phase and then a new hair will grow. And you can see that in the diagram there. So over time due to genetics, it's possible that the entire hair life cycle can shorten. There are many different types of hair loss um, in women. For um, non-scarring alopecias, the most common is the androgenic alopecia, which is female pattern hair loss. Telogen effluvium is an excessive shedding without a lot of regrowth. Traction alopecia um, can be from tight hairstyles or braids, tight ponytails. 
Um, and alopecia areata are spot, spotty bald spots that can come and go and wax and wane. Um, hair loss as a result of cancer therapy is also under this umbrella. And then more difficult to treat, um, you know, the hair follicle actually gets damaged under the scarring alopecia category, uh, includes frontal, fibro frontal fibrosing alopecia, CCCA, and LPP. Um, so the time frame that the hair follicle stays in each of these phases will determine how much shedding is occurring and how much free growth can occur. So treating female hair loss. The first step is we want to um, determine what the cause is of the hair loss. We'll do a thorough medical history, a hair history, physical exam. Um, when you come into the office, we actually take what's called trichoscopy, a ma magnifying device, and looks at your hair follicles um, kind of under a microscope. We do um, often either order blood work or we'll have you bring in your blood work uh, if it's within a year to kind of make sure that you're nutritionally in good shape um, to see if there's any underlying deficits that we can work on. And then if there's anything concerning for a scarring type of alopecia, we would do a biopsy to confirm that. And the treatment can vary greatly depending on which type of hair loss um, the patient has or what the underlying disease is. So we're going to talk about the history of PRP platelet rich plasma therapy. Um, so, our experience with PRP uh, is going to be the first topic. We'll talk about what it actually is, the history of PRP, um, how it works for hair loss, how we actually perform the PRP therapy. And then we'll talk about PRP versus PRF versus adipose stem cell therapy and the other types of. Um, and the different and other types of hair loss and how this kind of compares. So our experience with PRP, um, we opened in June of 2015. Um, and even at that point, some of our staff had already been performing PRP therapy for hair loss um, for over a year. Um, since 2015, we've done over 2,500 PRP treatments, and this is I'm sorry, 3,500 PRP treatments. I had some old data there. Um, and over 850 patients have been treated with PRP. So we're quite experienced in what we do. Um, we've been doing it for a while and do see multiple patients in uh, similar treatments throughout the day. So what exactly is platelet-rich plasma, PRP? PRP refers to the portion of centrifuge blood that contains a high concentration of platelets. And surrounding these platelets are growth factors, cytokines, and other plasma proteins, which help in um, cell growth. So PRP is derived by performing a simple blood draw, just like when you go to the lab to get your blood drawn. Um, we put it in a centrifuge and spin the blood, and it separates the various components of the blood. Um, and you can see in this diagram here, to the right where the platelet poor plasma is. So that's the yellow um, portion at the top, the platelet rich plasma in the middle, and that is the pink kind of in between the white and red blood cells. So that is the highest concentration of plasma and the growth factors that we're really looking for. Um, the red blood cells get centrifuged to the bottom and we throw that part away. Um, so when the blood is spun in a centrifuge, it separates the PRP from the platelet poor plasma and the red blood cells, as I had mentioned just in that diagram. So depending on the protocols used, the platelet concentration in PRP can be two to 10 times the baseline concentration of your normal platelet count. This is a little on the history of PRP therapy. Um, PRP was first developed and used in the 1970s uh, to treat patients with low platelet counts. Um, there are a lot of medical conditions, medications, some diseases that can result in low platelets. Um, platelets keep, play a key role, um, very important in our body that um, a lot of people don't realize that it does. So a lot of people think of platelets and they think of control of bleeding, um, but it's also um, super important, platelets uh, are super important in um, bringing growth factors to wound areas to help in healing. So it's super um, helpful in healing those, uh, taking those cells and kind of helping to heal. Um, so once this was discovered, scientists realized that you could use the PRP therapy for various medical specialties, uh, including facial cosmetic procedures, dental surgery, cardiovascular surgery, orthopedics is used um, 
in one of the bigger areas, it's used in sports medicine recently. Um, dermatology, it's used for hair growth and scar revision, wound healing, et cetera. Um, it's becoming more of a standard for some specialized problems. So PRP therapy for hair loss. Compared to other uses, PRP therapy for hair loss is relatively new. Um, it was first used to treat hair loss in 2004, but it really hasn't been used a lot until recently in the past five to six years um, that we've had studies that prove its, its full potential in treating hair loss. Um, so studies have shown that up to 85 to 90% of patients experience um, you know, improvement in terms of new growth, increased hair counts, increased hair widths, and stronger, healthier uh, surrounding tissue. So that's another benefit of PRP. It doesn't just stimulate the hair follicle, but there are also growth factors that stimulate the tissue surrounding the follicle to better support your hair. Um, so it utilizes growth factors surrounding the platelets found in your own blood that promote growth and healing. Um, the PRP stimulates dormant or miniaturized follicles to grow and makes follicles healthier and fuller. And PRP is found to be effective in the treatment of androgenic alopecia. It's kind of become one of the standards of treatment, traction alopecia and alopecia areata, which I talked about a few slides ago. Um, in some cases, we will also treat scarring alopecia in addition to, help, in addition to other treatments. Um, to help the scarring alopecia to stabilize. And in some instances, we actually have heart, had regrowth, which is pretty remarkable. So how, how PRP therapy is performed, um, uh, coming into the office, the treatment takes less than an hour. Um, we take a blood sample and then spin it in a centrifuge to separate the PRP. Um, like I had mentioned, and you saw the diagram in the previous slide. So we actually anesthetize the scalp. So you actually do not feel the PRP injections um, as we're doing the procedure. And then we use microtrauma to um, activate the PRP and begin the healing process. And that's through a process called microneedling with a microneedling pen. Um, recovery, pain is easily managed um, with Tylenol. There can be some mild swelling depending on the treatment area. Um, usually seen anywhere from four to six hours after your treatment, and this will resolve within a couple of days. Some people can have some mild bruising. It's very uncommon, but we have seen that. Um, you can drive home the day of your treatment, and you can shower that evening, wash your hair later that day. So we'll talk about PRP versus PRF versus adipose stem cell therapy. In recent years, practices have started offering PRP and platelet-rich fibrin therapy and adipose stem cell therapy. Platelet-rich fibrin therapy is very similar to PRP, but they do not use an anticoagulant. Um, PRF also includes calcium chloride, which we also use in our PRP treatments, but we, um, we do use an anticoagulant with um, PRP and platelet-rich fibrin therapy, there's no anticoagulant. Um, so the idea is that the fibrin matrix um, is created, in other words, it's a thicker matrix um, that's created slowly and releases the growth factors over time. Um, this is a newer treatment with less research and is not yet proven to be better than PRP. Um, so there's no real comparative studies yet. We do not have this treatment yet at this time. Um, again, there's not enough research done, but it's not something that we're discounting. Um, we do research here all the time to make sure we're getting the best therapies. So adipose stem cell therapy, it's a much more invasive treatment. Uh, it involves removing fat cells from the stomach, think similar to like a liposuction. Um, and then those are manipulated, uh, you know, the stem cells are obtained that way and later injected into the scalp. There's uh, increased FDA scrutiny on this procedure. There's a lot more complications um, as a result of this. It's actually not used as much anymore. You can still find places that are offering it, but um, possibly won't be a treatment option in the future. Um, the FDA now classifies adipose stem cells as a drug, which means it's under their ability to completely control and manage. And again, there's limited research on the benefit for this for hair loss as compared to what we already are doing with PRP. So how and why PRP protocol differ? So there's a lot of variability between um, 
practices and appropriate ways to go about doing PRP for hair restoration. Um, we'll talk about why those differ and um, the biggest challenge for patients, and we'll recommend some protocols at the end. So how PRP protocols differ. Um, there have been hundreds of studies on PRP therapy for hair loss, but the treatment protocols can uh, differ significantly. So the reason for this is that there's no standard for which an anticoagulant is used. There is no standard for how much blood should be drawn. There's no standard for st single versus double spin in the centrifuge. Um, there is no standard for the amount of PRP to use. Um, no standard for dilution of PRP, um, which is how much platelet plasma, uh, pore plasma to include. Um, there's no standard for which activator to use or to even use one. Um, there's different ways we can activate the PRP to start working. There's no standard for which the extracellular matrix could be used, should it not be used. Um, there's no standard for how much final product should be injected. There's no standard for whether microtrauma is necessary to activate the PRP. Um, and then uh, there's no standard on the number of treatments required and how often to give them. So um, really that's the big kind of lack of standard protocol. So why protocols differ? The biggest reason that PRP therapy uses the patient's own blood as the quote unquote medication is so it's not regulated by any government agency the way other treatments are. The PRP kits are registered with the FDA and must follow strict guidelines for safety. The research on PRP has been driven by physicians utilizing the treatment and the PRP kit manufacturers. Um, so we have to look at the research and see who are the ones doing it. And that's always a factor in how we look at the data. So protocols have been evolving as we come to better understand the power of PRP and the best ways to use it. Um, regenerative medicine is still fairly new. Um, and too often the protocols are being driven by the PRP kit distributors based on their in-house research. The biggest challenge for patients, so not all PRP therapy is the same, but it's currently being marketed as it were. So it's challenging for patients knowing that there are a variety of places you can go to get PRP, um, and consumers don't always know what, is actu what it is actually that they're getting. Um, PRP isn't always the right treatment for all patients, so it's not effective for all types of hair loss. And you know, here at Meditrust, we do comprehensive screening. So we wouldn't do PRP on anyone that has not had a consultation with myself um, or any other practitioners here in the practice. The most important step is to get in for a consult to make sure the type of hair loss that you have uh, is diagnosed appropriately and that the PRP will give you some benefit. The other thing to take into consideration is medications. So sometimes there are medications that can inhibit the responses of PRP. And so that is something that we'll take a look at later, um, but we'll advise you on at your consult as well. So PRP therapy for hair loss is starting to get a poor reputation as many practices are not properly evaluating patients um, for the cause of their hair loss. And we get this a lot. People have gone to other places and come to us not really ready to give up on PRP yet, but they've uh, you know read the research and know there's like backed data that there is benefit to PRP, um, but they didn't nece necessarily achieve good results or benefit when having PRP somewhere else. Um, so we get a lot of like second um, opinion type things or continuation of a series of PRP that you're in. Um, so we see that pretty frequently. Um, one big thing with PRP is to make sure that the practitioner is experienced with both PRP and treating hair loss. Um, for example, there are a lot of med spas out there that um, have a variety of services. But they don't necessarily do PRP um, and hair restoration frequently. So, you know, in a, a day, a busy day, we can do anywhere from seven to eight treatments um, back to back. So we do it all day here um, and very well versed in actually doing the the treatments. Um, so we like to set realistic expectations. Um, you know, results can vary from one patient to the other. And depending on how long the hair loss has occurred or how progressive, you know, PRP may not be the realistic option. Um, we want to always choose a realistic treatment plan. And if loss is extensive, we consider doing not only PRP, but other, you know, low level, level laser therapy supplements, um, 
in combination. So it, it just kind of depends. It's very, very customized and patient specific. So this um, is the recommended protocol from the dermatologic, the Journal of Dermatologic Surgery. Um, in October of 2009, um, the dermatologic surgery um, came out with a platelet-rich plasma as a treatment of androgenic alopecia. So it reviewed 10 of the most substantive studies on PRP uh, as a treatment for hair loss. So this study did provide the following recommendations. Um, initiate treatment series of one treatment a month for three months, maintenance treatments after the initial series, meaning a booster every year, sometimes every six to 12 months, depending on the circumstances, um, activating the platelets with calcium chloride or scalp needle needling, and we do both. Um, and then a big thing um, that the research has kind of proven is optimal platelet concentration of platelets is 1.5 billion per ml. Um, with our OPC therapy, we do get 1.4 to 1.6 billion platelets per ml. So we follow these recommendations from the Journal of Dermatologic Surgery. Um, this has kind of cemented our protocol um, based on their research. Another big thing that our um, practice focuses on and have found much improved results compared to other places is that treating with PRP, we found treating a smaller area has been proven um, to have much better results focusing us on a smaller area. So we're not spreading those platelets thin throughout the entire scalp. We're really focusing on those areas of loss. We'll talk here a little bit about OPC. So something we've researched in the office um, is OPC, optimal platelet concentration therapy. Um, and we'll talk about why it's different from PRP. We do do both PRP and OPC therapies in the office. So optimal platelet concentration, um, like I mentioned a couple slides ago, studies have shown that between 1.4 and 1.6 billion platelets per ml is the optimal concentration for PRP. We did our own kind of internal testing and you know, started um, with research and took our own data to kind of look at the top PRP systems to figure out the best system for our new treatment. Um, so we tested by taking platelet counts before and after spinning to determine which machines could consistently deliver the best concentrations of that above mentioned 1.4 billion and 1.6 billion. Um, so what our testing showed us is that many of the systems cannot deliver optimal concentrations, meaning we were not getting that 1.4 to 1.6 billion per mLs. Um, many of the systems deliver inconsistent results. There's a lot of variability and your platelet account your platelet counts vary day to day um, and everyone's platelet count is different. So a big piece for us was being able to get a platelet counter, which we do with every OPC treatment. Um, we test a platelet count on the exact day of your treatment and customize it from there. So why OPC was developed? So in 2018, we started having a lot of um, kind of discussions about our PRP protocols. Due to what we were seeing in the latest studies, conferences we had been to, talks with colleagues in our field, um, just to kind of see what other people were doing, what knowledge they had. We were having good results with the PRP, but results were really pretty variable. Um, and um, it was frustrating for us because we want everyone to have a great result. So we were starting to suspect that the platelet count had to be a big reason why. We knew that you know, every patient was unique in terms of platelet count, but we were essentially giving them the same treatment to each patient. So each protocol was the same. We'd inject the same amount to each patient. Um, but again, with the research that was coming out about the importance of the 1.5 billion platelet concentration, um, we, in the early uh, 2019, we released the optimal platelet concentration therapy after testing all of these different kits. So what makes OPC different from PRP? Um, so with OPC, a platelet count is taken with each treatment to determine your baseline platelet count at the time of treatment. Your platelet count can vary from treatment to treatment. So the, the, cha you know, the change, um, the um, amount of PRP that is needed um, gets to you in the appropriate 1.4, 1.6 billion platelet range. Um, so again, that changes day to day. Um, and we take that on that exact day to see what's appropriate for you then um, and customize that to the specific treatment volume 
um, instead of providing just a general standard treatment. We optimize the final PRP solution based on your platelet count to improve optimal concentrations. Um, so we can dilute it or um, dilute it more or make it more concentrated. Um, so whatever you're, you're needing that day. Um, and you get, wanna get that concentration for what we call angiogenesis, which is just a fancy medical term for blood vessel repair. So treatment expectation results. So goals of treatment and expectations are huge for us. Um, you know, again, we want to set realistic expectations with people. Um, we'll, we'll go through some before and after pictures at the end, but a big thing is setting realistic uh, treatment options. We never want uh, realistic treatment goals. We never want anyone to be um, disappointed. So our goals, um, like I said, it's important to set treatment goals because results can vary from person to person. That being said, um, the overall expected results for PRP therapy are very positive uh, and with OPC. We expect um, over 85% of patients have a positive result and positive can mean a number of things. So one could be uh, stopping the hair loss. So, you know, the minimum treat, minimum result we want to get from any, any treatment we do is to halt the progression of hair loss because most types of hair loss are progressive. Um, so if you had not had the treatment, um, you know, your loss would have been much worse. And in one of our prior webinars, um, Diana, our nurse practitioner here used a great example of, you know, someone, for example, comes in um, at the age of 40, uh, for hair loss, and it will really change the trajectory um, dramatically when this person's in their 80s, you know, their hair loss won't be nearly as significant later down the road. Um, a, another um, big um, positive is to stop excessive shedding or slow, excessive, slow shedding. Um, Another is decreased miniaturization, which is that thinning um, and increasing the hair diameter, and then regrowth in many cases. Um, so a positive result can be one, a combination, or all of any of these uh, things that I just mentioned, and it will vary from person to person. Um, so it's important to remember that if you're not properly evaluated and diagnosed, PRP might not be the right therapy for you. Um, it might not be the correct therapy treatment for you at the time. Um, and if you're not a good candidate, we'll advise you in some alternative options and maybe getting certain things under control and then getting, um, you know, PRP may be an option down the line. So this is a little before and after photo disclaimer. Um, again, I know we keep mentioning um, that individual patient results can vary. So um, our goal of treatment are to number one, stop the hair loss from getting any worse thicken and potentially regrow your hair. So these photos that you're gonna see um, are some of our stronger results. Um, so, you know, um, just keep, keep that in mind that these are some of our most dramatic results. So again, pictures can be deceiving. So we want everyone to remain kind of realistic in your expectations. And this is obviously an exceptional result. So this is before and after. Um, PRP, a uh, series of three PRP treatments with the laser cap uh, for someone who had, which is the low level laser therapy um, in a woman who had androgenic alopecia. And this is um, before and then at the 12 month mark. A pretty dramatic improvement there. This um, is before um, and after a series of three OPC, the optimal platelet concentration treatments for androgenic alopecia. And this is before and after at two months. So really early, um, we're already seeing improvement there. It does take anywhere from um, six to 12 months to really see improvement, but we can potentially start seeing improvements as early as two to three months. Um, this is, uh, again, a before and after of the PRP therapy, three treatments, the series of three uh, for someone with androgenic alopecia. You can see thinning along the hairline there at the, uh, the before photo, and then after um, with improvement there in the, um, th you know, the width of her part has gotten significantly smaller. So, um, again, we've, we've noticed with our research that treating smaller areas is where we're getting these better results from. 
So this is before and after a series of OPC uh, in combination with low level laser. So the laser cap at home for someone with female pattern hair loss or androgenic alopecia. Um, and this is only at a six month mark. So we do expect even further improvement from here. And again, it takes anywhere from six months to a year to really see the actual improvement. This is before and after uh, a series of PRP treatments uh, for traction alopecia. So that's um, tight braids or um, tight ponytails where the hair, um, you know, pulling kind of pulls the hairline back essentially. This is the before and then at 12 months. So she had significant growth along the hairline there. Now this is um, a before and after of um, a series of five PRP treatments for alopecia areata. So as I mentioned in one of the very first slides, um, you know, those are alopecia areata is where um, people experience those coin-shaped lesions and she had significant loss here. Um, so this is substantial improvement, um, you know, very, very successful. Um, this is with a, a five treatments, a series of three and then the boosters throughout. And this again is only at the six month mark. So this is um, a before and after of a series of PRP for scarring alopecia. This um, patient had CCCA alopecia, and this is her before and at six months. Um, so up until this point, we hadn't treated a ton of people for scarring alopecia, and there isn't a ton of research on this, um, but this patient was very persistent that she wanted to try it. She wanted to do everything she could. Uh, and she actually did have a very successful result, as you can see, and that was in a pretty short time frame. This is only uh, at the six month mark. So this prompted us to try it on other types of scarring alopecia, and we've seen some successful results with this, but not always. And like with anything, um, even androgenic alopecia, it's not always 100% either, um, but we've started to treat more scarring patients since this, since this in particular, but with scarring alopecia, there's other treatments involved as well. So this is in addition to uh, standard treatments that we have. I'm gonna open it up now for some time for questions and answers. Let me just pull these up here. Um, the first question is, how many tubes um, do you take from a patient? It seems like such a tiny amount is in the tube after spinning. Is this enough to actually promote a change? Yes, so if you remember in the slide that I had the picture of um, the platelet poor um, plasma, the platelet rich plasma, and then the red blood cells. So what's really driving our um, research is in that smaller amount is taking that PRP rich platelets. Um, that 1.4 to 1.6 billion platelet count is only going to be found there. And the platelet rich poor, um, poor section, that yellow plasma, you're really, really dilute, not having tons of platelets there, um, which from my personal experience, um, a lot of places use a lot of the the plasma and it's just bring, being spread way too thin and you're not getting that PRP um, concentrated 1.4 to 1.6 billion that's proven in the research to um, actually give results with growth factor. Um, so we have another question here, describe microtrauma. So microtrauma is taking the microneedling pen, um, which is a two millimeter pen um, that after we anesthetize the scalp, inject the PRP, we take a microneedling pen and go over the areas that we treated. This activates the platelets. Um, in addition to the calcium chloride we use, but it helps activate the platelets um, to, to get those growth factors working. We have another question here, are OP, um, OPC boosters to be expected every year for the rest of your life? Essentially, yes. Um, you know, any treatment with hair is going to be for life, depending on the type of hair loss that you have. So female pattern hair loss, the most common type is progressive. Most hair loss is uh, progressive. So you need to continue therapies to prevent it from getting any worse. Um, they're all kind of maintenance things, just like, you know, skincare or other treatments that you do for yourself. Um, so yes, essentially for life, unless you're having, 
you know, amazing results and, and things are stabilized and you're happy, then no, you don't necessarily need to continue for life. But typically, yes, any treatment for hair, we continue for life. So we have a question, are hats and or wigs allowed during treatments? Yes, so we actually will send you out of the office after a treatment with a hat if you prefer, you can bring your own. Um, your scalp will just be a little bit red after the treatment, um, but you can, you can certainly wear a hat. Wigs are fine as long as you're giving yourself time in between, same hats and wigs. Um, any, you know, any time that you're giving your hair a break from anything tight on your scalp is going to just provide a healthier environment for your scalp for hair to, to grow. Um, there's another question here. How well do these platelet treatments work in older women? Um, a question around a woman in her mid seventies. Um, again, this is patient specific and dependent on the degree of loss. So, I would encourage you to come in for a consultation, whether that be video or in person. Um, but we see similar results um, throughout the age span. It just depends on the person and it depends on the area we're treating. Again, we wanna focus on smaller areas to treat. Um, and, um, you know, it's variable from person to person. But Age-wise, um, again, you know, if you're somebody in your mid to late 70s who hasn't done any treatments and the loss is significant, we may want to start with something else um, before doing PRP. So we have a question about the cost of these treatments. So for the series of three of PRP, it's um, 2,500. That is with the six-month and 12-month follow-up, and then yearly um, for the booster, it's about 850. For the OPC, which again is the one where we draw more blood and spin it through the centrifuge twice, um, it's a little more expensive. It's 3,500 for the series of three with the six month and 12 month follow-up. Um, and then it's 1050 a year for the annual booster. So we have a question here. Um, do you see hair loss when doing the PRP treatment due to the trauma of needling of the scalp? No, um, so we do sometimes see an increase in shedding between the first and second uh, treatment in that series. But in terms of the micro trauma, uh, like from the micro needling, we are very careful to not damage any hair that you have there. So a lot of places are pretty um, lax with their use of the micro needling pen, meaning they'll go in a circular motion and kind of create like a shearing tearing motion. We more stamp a little bit more like elegantly, delicately to make sure that we're not um, damaging any of your hair that you do have and part it and separate it um, very, very carefully. So does the use of hair powder inhibit the positive effects of OPC? Um, I can't say for sure that it would inhibit the effects of OPC, but Big things with hair powders, um, if they're left on for a long period of time, you know, you really want to give your scalp a good cleaning every week. Um, so hair powder can sometimes block the follicles and not give a healthy environment for your hair to grow. Um, I don't think that it would necessarily um, harp negatively on the OPC therapy, but just in general as a good rule of thumb, um, you know, washing your hair every few days, every other day or every two days is kind of what we would say as the minimum. A lot of people think, um, you know, using a dry shampoo for the week and washing your hair as least amount of possible is better. But in reality, um, keeping that, that scalp healthy um, through um, cleansing and even using like a good scalp root cleanser once a week is the best for your, uh, your hair. The question, can you still color your hair? Yes, so coloring your hair up until a few days before the treatment is fine. Um, we just would like for you to wash your hair once before, um, you know, after coloring before your treatment and then waiting seven days um, after the treatment if you were to color your hair after. 
Can you describe the appearance of the scalp immediately after the treatments? So a little bit red. Um, we do a really good job keeping your hair clean. Um, so minimal bleeding um, and we clean you up really well before you go. It will just look a little bit red. Um, oftentimes your own hair will cover it, um, but most people are unbothered by it. Some choose to wear a hat of their own or we have hats here that we can provide you with. Are the three treatments usually sufficient for treatment? Do you ever have to do more than treat three? Um, patient specific, um, yes, the research is showing that the three treatments are sufficient for treatment to show improvement. Um, at the six month and 12 month mark is when we'll decide whether or not you need a booster sooner rather than later, um, whether or not we need to do the booster at six months or at 12 months. Um, you know, if money is no object, some people opt to do the boosters every six months um, just to further enhance their results. But um, typically, no, you don't have to do more than three. Unless you're out of that treatment phase, um, you know, the four to six weeks apart, there may be, you know, some issues there. And next we have, is there any risk of infection with the microneedling? Um, so really, really low risk. We cleanse your scalp before we do the treatment, um, but also platelets are actually, um, you know, the environment is so acidic from the platelets that it doesn't free grounds for bacteria to grow. We've never had an infection here at ManyDress. Just leave a few more minutes for questions. Um, feel free to put anything you want to ask in the Q&A tab. We have a question here. Um, if boosters are showing positive hair regrowth, is it likely that will continue each? If boosters are showing positive hair regrowth, is it likely that it will continue each year? Um, yes, so, you know, these treatments kind of build on each other. And um, the longer you're kind of giving yourself time to see these results, um, the better. So they, they build on one another. And, um, you know, if you're having regrowth from the booster series, it's likely that it will continue to improve. Um, there's a question here, would it make sense for someone to get the treatment in the winter if someone is in chlorine or salt water in the summer frequently? Probably yes. Um, you know, it would be more beneficial to do it in the winter, um, but it doesn't really necessarily halt um, the treatment. But yes, I would say probably better in the winter if you're somebody who's in uh, chlorine. There's a question, do the three treatments have to be exactly three months apart? Could they be spread out a bit? Yes, they can be spread out a bit, um, a four to six week time frame between each treatment. So it may be, you know, if you're exactly on point every four weeks um, or six weeks, that's fine. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be completely exact, but we do like to keep it in what we call our treatment phase um, of six weeks between each treatment. Okay, if there's no more questions, we will end our webinar here. If there's anything that you think of later that you wanna ask us, feel free to uh, email info at ManyTrust and one of us will get back to you. But I will be here again next Wednesday at 1230 with a different topic. And thank you all for joining today.